Hi, this is Dr. A. In this basic set chemistry series, we're going to look at acid-base balance. So generally, the lungs and kidneys maintain acid-base homeostasis or acid-base balance. Um, the kidneys, their principal role in maintaining acid-base balance is to regulate concentration of bicarbonate in the blood. Um, bicarb is the base. And the kidneys can regulate um, the bicarbonate by either excreting more bicarbonate, and they can also excrete more acids, or retaining uh, more bicarbonate and putting it back into the blood. The lungs, its principal role in maintaining acid-base balance is to regulate the partial pressure of CO2 as a gas. And um, CO2 is considered an acid. And uh, the way the lungs would regulate it would be that um, it can breathe out more CO2 by increasing the breathing, or it can retain more CO2 by decreasing the rate of breathing. The other major functions of the lung is to oxygenate the blood. Oxygen in arterial blood is present in three forms. Oxygen gas, measured as the partial pressure of O2, dissolved oxygen, and oxygen-bound hemoglobin, which is oxyhemoglobin. The acid-base disorders are characterized according to the primary abnormality or the chemical event that disturbs the pH. An acidosis is a below normal pH or a pH less than 7.4. Alkalosis is an above normal pH or a pH above 7.4. We're gonna look the ranges a little bit wider than that, but not, not by much. And then these can also be further classified as either respiratory or metabolic. And so if it is respiratory, it's a carbon dioxide that is uh, either too high or too low. And if it is metabolic, it is the bicarb that's either too high or too low. And so um, respiratory acidosis will have an elevation of carbon dioxide gas, which is an acid, which is what causes acidosis. Respiratory alkalosis has a deficit of carbon dioxide, so not enough acid, meaning it's an alkaline state. And metabolic acidosis is a deficit of bicarb, so you've lost uh, or you don't have enough of the base to counter the acids, so there's too many acids. And uh, metabolic alkalosis is an excess of bicarb or an excess of base, and so you have an alkaline state. The arterial blood gases um, are a test that measures the acidity uh, as the pH of the blood and the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide gases in the blood that is drawn from an artery. It can also calculate the bicarbonate concentration based on all of these readings. By using arterial blood, oxygen and carbon dioxide levels can be measured before they enter the body tissues, so they're fresh from the lungs and haven't been delivered to the tissues yet, so they haven't really been consumed yet. Um, and the most common site used to draw arterial blood is going to be the radial artery uh, in the wrist. Um, other sites that can be used include the brachial and femoral artery. So brachial is going to be yeah, here. Um, and then femoral is in the groin there. And the femoral artery is usually, in most hospitals, only accessed by a physician. And ABG is used to check how well the lungs are able to move oxygen into the blood and remove carbon dioxide from the blood. So why would a physician order an ABG? First, to check for severe breathing problems in lung diseases, such as patients that come in with asthma, cystic fibrosis, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, under which falls um, emphysema and uh, chronic bronchitis. To determine how well the treatment for a certain lung disease um, is working. So how is their asthma treatment going? How is the COPD treatment going? To determine if a patient needs extra oxygen or help with breathing, like mechanical ventilation, um, although now there are also um, help that can become in the form of putting a patient on a BiPAP machine, which can help um, with the pressures and allow more oxygen to come in, but also uh, CO2 to be pulled off um, more easily without having to put a patient on a ventilator. But of course, an ABG could help determine how much help the patient needs and whether or not they need to be put on mechan mechanical ventilation. 
Uh, they are done also to determine if a patient is receiving the right amount of oxygen when using oxygen in the hospital, although the pulse oximetry that uh, you can put on a patient's finger is a much less invasive test, but sometimes the doctor wants to know exactly what's going on also with the CO2 and the pH and everything else. So uh, the pulse oximetry is nice, non-invasive, can give you the amount of oxygen, but it only measures that. And then also measure the acid base level in the blood of patients that have heart failure, kidney failure, uncontrolled diabetes, sleep disorders, severe infections, or after a drug overdose. And as you note, most of those are completely unrelated to lung function other than maybe sleep disorders. Uh, and these are all like all metabolic diseases that can affect the pH and the acid base balance in the blood. So the pH, the normal range is 7.36 to 7.44. So just saying 7.4 is kind of the normal uh, blood pH in a human body. This is the first value to consider when uh, looking at ABGs to assess a patient's acid base status. So first we want to classify them. Are they, are they okay? Are they normal? Are they, or at least compensated? Their the pH is okay. Or do they have acidemia or alkalemia? Acidemia meaning the uh, pH is 7.35 or lower, and alkalemia meaning the arterial pH is 7.45 or higher. Now in acidosis versus alkalosis, acidosis is simply an, a disorder that lowers the pH. So um, a respiratory acidosis would have acidemia or a low pH, uh, an arterial pH below 7.35. Alkalosis is a disorder that raises the pH. Spurious pH values are most commonly due to uh, an inadvertent sampling of venous blood. Spurious means that the results on the ABG aren't matching what you would expect in the clinical picture. And so um, sometimes it's hard to get an adequate um, sample of arterial blood and it's possible to hit a vein instead of an artery. And so that should always be a, consider, a consideration if the results aren't matching the patient's presentation. And uh, for the pH, the pH of venous blood is slightly more acidic than that of arterial blood. The arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide, um, the PCO2, the normal range is 36 to 44 millimeters of mercury because that's the gas pressure. It provides information about the adequacy of lung function in excreting carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide as a gas is a waste and the body is supposed to be getting rid of it. There's always some of it that's going to stay in the blood and there's a normal level of it in the blood, but ideally your lungs get rid of the carbon dioxide that's being produced. An elevation of carbon dioxide uh, partial pressure usually implies inadequate ventilation, meaning usually hypoventilation, not breathing enough and not being able to get rid of that gas, of that CO2 waste, uh, but it could also be hyperventilation and then there's too much of it that's leaving the body. Again, like the pH, spurious values uh, are usually due to uh, venous sampling uh, and venous blood have a higher carbon dioxide um, pressure and content than arterial blood does. The arterial partial pressure of oxygen, or the PO2, the normal range is 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. It provides information about the level of oxygenation of arterial blood, so how well uh, oxygen is getting into from the lungs into the blood. Um, this partial pressure of oxygen can be reduced in conduction, conjunction with an elevated PCO2 in states that are associated with hypoventilation. So if the patient is not breathing adequately, not breathing enough, the CO2 will accumulate and be high, and not enough oxygen will get in, so it will be low. Again, spurious low values are seen with venous blood samples because venous blood has less um, oxygen than arterial blood. Uh, but it can also be seen if that arterial blood sample was not stored on ice before the test was run or if it wasn't run immediately. Uh, so there's a very, there's a small window of testing. Um, so as soon as that sample is collected, it really should be tested. Uh, but if there's any delay, the sample should be put on ice. Serum bicarbonate, also known as carbon dioxide or total CO2. 
this can get confusing confusing so this is not the same as the partial pressure of co2 the normal range for a serum bicarb is 24 to 30 uh, millimoles per liter and um, you can get that value either as the bicarb reading on the abg or they list it as total carbon dioxide content of serum or plasma from a basic metabolic panel or comprehensive metabolic panel that are run on the big chemistry analyzers uh, in chemistry. Um, and either one of them can be used to assess um, acid base disorders. And this is because uh, carbon dioxide in the blood is actually mostly transported as bicarb, so that there is a very close relationship to the total carbon dioxide in the serum bicarb, which is different from the partial pressure of carbon dioxide gas. Uh, let's look at the acid base disorders. So we're going to start with metabolic acidosis. The patients will display an acidemia, so a low pH value, and a low serum bicarb concentration. So both values are low. And the PCO2 will either be normal or will also be low. So in metabolic acidosis, everything goes down, okay? So in the most circumstances, the body compensates by hyperventilating because remember, p think of PCO2 as an acid, the partial pressure of CO2 as an acid, uh, that gas. And so it hyperventilates, uh, the body hyperventilates to get rid of uh, excess uh, or just get rid of uh, acid um, so that it can uh, compensate for that metabolic acidosis for too much acids being in the blood. So what causes metabolic acidosis? Um, and so these are all going to be like non-lung causes, non-respiratory causes, because it's a metabolic problem. So renal failure, ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, so um, in renal failure, the kidneys normally excrete acids, and so if they're not working right, they'll be, they won't be able to excrete the acids as they should. Ketoacidosis happens uh, mostly diabetic ketoacids, so it's an excessive accumulation of ketoacids. Uh, lactic acidosis uh, happens usually when there is uh, inadequate oxygenation uh, in certain areas of the body or inadequate blood perfusion. Um, so. Um, the, it's anaerobic metabolism is what's going on, uh, and that is, produces lactic acids, and if too much of those accumulate, you get lactic acidosis. Intoxications, renal tubular acidosis, drugs, toxins, all of those deal with too many acids accumulating in the body. And then diarrhea can cause metabolic acidosis because of a severe loss of bicarb through the diarrhea. So you lost a base. Metabolic alkalosis is the opposite. So you have an alkalemia or a high pH and you have a high bicarb. So both of them are elevated and your partial pressure of CO2 will either be normal or uh, it will be increased because uh, the compensation mechanism is going to be hyperventilating. So it'll, uh, the body will decrease the breathing rate. And so CO2 as an acid will be retained to compensate for the excess of base. Uh, the common causes of metabolic alkalosis include the loss of gastric acid. So this could happen with excessive vomiting, but it can also happen with nasogastric suctioning. Uh, mineral corticoid excess, um, so excess aldosterone and cortisol, et cetera. Uh, alkali administration. So um, that would could be seen if they're trying to treat a metabolic acidosis, sorry, and they give too much bicarb and then you can go from one end to the other and go into alkalosis and then diuretic therapy uh, because um, some of these loop di diuretics cause a loss of chloride and a retention of bicarb and so that would elevate the serum bicarb Next, we have respiratory acidosis. Um, the lab results are going to show a low pH. So again, acidemia. So pH is going to go down and CO2 is going to go up. So you have opposite movement here uh, between the pH and the CO2. And usually the bicarb is normal, um, unless it's chronic, and we're going to address this in just a second. So it's usually synonymous with hypoventilation, meaning the body's not able to move that CO2 out, and so it's accumulating. Um, and so again, the CO2 as a gas is an 
think of it as an acid, and so therefore that would lower the pH. Common causes of respiratory acidosis are going to include uh, central nervous system disorders where the rate of, of breathing control center is going to be affected and uh, the patient simply is not breathing enough. And so uh, brain injuries can, can cause that, uh, but also certain uh, overdoses of drugs that depress the central nervous system could cause uh, respiratory acidosis because the patients simply aren't breathing enough. Um, all the lung disorders, um, including uh, especially your um, COPD, like emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Now, in those COPD lung disorders where the, uh, the patients chronically retain CO2, if they're just in their normal chronic state, the CO2 will be elevated, but the pH will be normal. And what the body does to compensate for that excess acid is that the bicarb will also be elevated. And this is on a, it's chronic. Okay, so if the pH is normal and then the CO2 is high and the bicarb is high, this is a chronic COPD patient. But if they're having an acute episode or something is really wrong, then their pH will be low and their, bicarb, their um, CO2 will be elevated beyond what they normally are. It's going to be extremely high. And then uh, certain neuromuscular disorders can cause a problem. So if the muscles that are required for breathing are not working, uh, such as for maybe in Guillain-Barre or some of the, um, you know, other, anything that affects um, muscle function where the muscles can't do the, the, the work of breathing, then those will cause hypoventilation and cause respiratory acidosis. And then uh, respiratory alkalosis, the uh, lab results would reveal an elevated pH and a low CO2, so we go in opposite directions again. Uh, and usually the bicarb is unchanged. Um, and this can result from increased ventilation in patients, and they also experience symptoms that are mild and consist of dizziness, lightheadedness, and paresthesias, which are tingling in the extremities, like in the hands and maybe in the feet. Um, and so this, just think of a typical panic attack or anxiety attack where the person's hyperventilating. They basically are going to blow off too much of their CO2 and they're, it'll drive their pH up. And they'll have dizziness, lightheadedness, and tingling. Uh, the most common causes of respiratory alkalosis are going to be hypoxemia, so not getting enough oxygen in the blood, which would cause you to hyperventilate. Um, certain lung diseases and um, CNS respiratory stimulation, so certain drugs that might uh, cause that uh, respiratory stimulation, like an overdose of aspirin, um, then it's going to drive, again, the breathing rate up, and that can cause a respiratory alkalosis. Also, um, if a patient was in respiratory acidosis and we put them on a me mechanical ventilator and we overventilated them, they could go into respiratory alkalosis by simply overcorrection. So um, there you go. So that wraps up um, acid-based disorders, and I thank you for your attention.